Yep, there we go. Uh, so that, that's uh, the website of the Tesseract Academy where the organizer for this event. Um, make sure to visit us. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Tesseract Academy. Uh, let me send you, I'm going to send a link, my LinkedIn profile for anyone who wants to connect. I've spent pretty much all my career in the space of AI and data science, um, but also I've spent a considerable amount in uh, blockchain and Web3. Uh, the goal of the Tesseract Academy is to help senior professionals better understand technology, primarily AI and, and Web3. Um, so we, we do this through various ways. Um, we have courses. Uh, now we also have a data science certificate, which we're about to launch, which provides you not only with online with courses, but also with coaching and advice. And we also have consulting services in many different areas, uh, ranging from data strategy all the way to data science implementation. Uh, if you go on our website, you're going to see some of the, our clients, whether it's companies that we worked with or individuals. And uh, we, and as you'll see, there's lots of content there from like courses all the way to free frameworks, including topics, obviously, such as data strategy, but also product management. Uh, so Greg is one of our external partners who specializes in product management, uh, which we believe is a very important topic, and especially the intersection between AI and product management, because AI is moving very fast. So it's perfectly clear, I think, to everyone that many professional areas are going to change in the near future as a result of this development. And that's why with the Test First Academy, we uh, we do what we do, helping senior professionals better understand data science. Um, so Greg today is going to present his views on how AI is going to affect product management. And then we're going to follow up with an open Q&A. Uh, just a, a note, uh, before we start, uh, I also, for, for any of you who are interested in data science and AI from a high-level perspective, I've written two books on that topic, which you can both find on Amazon. Uh, but if you drop me an email, uh, I'm more than happy to share a PDF with you. Uh, if you Google my name, and I'm going to share this in, in the chat, you'll see that the books are five-star rated. But uh, we've made a tradition of always handing out the books to those who are proactive enough to join our events and then uh, drop us an email. So we would be more than happy to, to hear from you. Uh, so that's it for me. And now, Greg, the, the stage is yours. Yeah. You're mute. Let me get my, um, make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Okay, so today we are talking about AI and the future of product management. This could go just about anywhere, right? Uh, product management is becoming a real force in the market. AI is shaking things up, especially recently. So I'm going to talk a lot about recent developments around AI. I want to do a little bit of level setting because these are both really big areas. So stick with me through 10 slides, and then I think uh, we will change things up and I think uh, things will get uh, really interesting. So, AI is already impacting product management. Uh, it's creating new ways of working. It's creating new expectations in markets. It's allowing product managers, and let's face it, we're time challenged to be more efficient, and that is a big deal. Later, I will talk about some kind of what I call archetypes for applications of AI, and we'll talk a little bit about the technology. But AI is basically an attempt, right, to make computers think and act like people, uh, make decisions do interesting kind of interactions with people. And it can help product managers in a bunch of ways, more ways than we could ever cover in one webinar. Today, we'll talk about product development itself. We'll talk about pricing, which some people don't think about, how it can help us with marketing. So I think these are areas where product managers tend to be a little weak, go to market in my experience, for example, 
Uh, and I think we have a real opportunity with AI to multiply our efforts. Uh, if we think about product development, AI can do some great things. It can take tons of feedback from customers. It can find key insights. It can find trends. It can help us with prioritization, which I think is super important. Um, when it comes to pricing, the truth is most product managers are not involved enough in pricing, especially as you go to scale up towards kind of grown-ups, big companies. But pricing is still our biggest lever to influence profitability. So AI can help us identify market trends. It can do competitive pricing analysis, which can really save us a lot of work. Uh, marketing, where typically we're weak. Very often what I'm seeing in bigger organizations is marketing is understaffed. So AI can actually plan campaigns for us, can help us execute them, can help us analyze the results, can help us determine if our launch was successful. And I think support is one of the areas that will have the biggest impact short term. People expect there to be support 24-7. We all see this now, these chatbots that jump up, they're still very primitive, but that will change. I think the experience will be further integrated uh, into applications and we can talk about that, but there are a lot of challenges around AI. So most AI technologies are very data hungry and garbage in, garbage out. We can introduce bias uh, into like machine learning, which can lead to really unexpected results that can hurt our brand. It's complex. There's not going to be 10 years from now less regulation around AI, right? There's going to be a lot more. And adopting AI requires a change far beyond just the product team, beyond product management. It's really a new critter that everybody has to, to understand, including leadership, people we don't always think of, like accounting and finance. How do we account for these things? So there is a bright future for product management leveraging AI in our products and in our personal productivity. Uh, and we should expect for products to get much better and easier to develop. Now, I just took you through 10 overview slides. I don't know what you thought of them. I think they're okay. That's as far as I would go with them. Not particularly insightful, not particularly deep. I showed this to a few people and some of them are like, yeah, that's where you should start at level sets. Other people were so frustrated I could barely get through the slides because they're so basic. So let's talk about where these slides came from. At the top of this slide, you see the prompt that I put into chat GPT. I asked it, to, as you can see, uh, generate slides on how AI will impact product management. And it gave me a series of slides with titles, suggested a graphic. Sorry, Greg, I think you might be sharing the wrong mode because it looks like uh, the slides are a bit small. Uh, okay, let me see if I can. The wrong screen. Uh, and I don't know, let me just uh, start over. I don't know. I'll switch this other one, even though it shows up as uh, black. Let me go back into and let me flip these things and tell me if this works. Can you see the slide? Is it uh, the right size? No, it's better. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. So uh, I basically had Chat GPT generate the slides that you looked at. I just copied the titles and the text in there. I let PowerPoint suggests the images, and I'm sure Microsoft will tell us that that's AI-based, whether it is or not, I don't know. And I came up with an okay slide deck in very, very short order. So I'm kind of curious if you could put in the comments, how many of you have played with ChatGPT? How many of you are using it daily? I'm wondering if you're getting productive use out of it. 
but this is the new way that we will be creating content. And this makes us more efficient, but these types of technologies are also changing expectations from users. So I just typed in a quick chat GPT prompt. I created a blank PowerPoint, copied the title and text. I had to do an additional prompt for the challenges and I just copied that over. Uh, I told you about, you know, PowerPoint suggesting the images. This took me about 15 minutes. Copying, pasting took a little more time than I would have liked. And it was the first time I've done it this way. I'm sure I could cut that time in half. So if we think about this from a content perspective, I would give it like a four out of 10. Those slides were not particularly compelling. They didn't look too bad. Uh, they did have some relevant information, but I think anything interesting would have to come from the soundtrack. But if I look at the value to me as an end user and as a product manager, I would give it a nine out of 10. And that's because I didn't stare at a blank page wondering what the structure should be. We should not overlook the value of inspiration. I think as human beings, we're much better at refining something that exists than starting from scratch. And within a few minutes, I had a minimum viable presentation and there's just nothing wrong with that. I could run with that thing under really intense pressure. I could present that thing and in the soundtrack, I could probably make it interesting enough that we wouldn't lose half the participants in the meeting. So I want to show you one more example. Uh, we saw uh, like ChatGPT is pretty good at generating content, but I want to show you an example of how I actually used it to increase my productivity and use that to discuss what is happening from a user expectation perspective, because we are in the middle of a massive change. At least that's the argument that I'm going to make. So one of the things that I do in my consulting practice is I do maturity assessments for product management organizations. Gather a bunch of data, I have a model, calculate a maturity score. But one of the most important things I do is get input from all the non-PM functions. So I request data from engineering, marketing, customer support, quality, architects, I, I mean, all it depends on the client, you know, which uh, disciplines they have. And what I do is I just send them an Excel. And Excel is an underrated forms technology. It's really good. You can do most of what you need to do. Everybody knows how to use it. Everybody has Excel. And you can do some pretty powerful analytics. I can do, you know, Excel will support way more than what I need to do to get averages. So across those disciplines, there are some common questions. I wanna see how, as a group, they feel about product management. I wanna see how each discipline feels about product management. This is a subset. This is basically what the form looks like. It's a series of questions. They can select a response and add a comment. Super simple. I don't need to do anything online. People can do everything offline if they choose to. There's no training. A lot of the online forms online forms technologies, ask one question at a time, you know, display one question at a time. But I pay for that convenience and the fact that I can just ship these things around in email or leave a template in a file. And that is if I want to aggregate all the data, that's not trivial. There are ways through Excel that you can do it. You can access data in a folder and stuff. I have found those things very counterintuitive. And if something goes wrong, it's very hard to deal with. So today, the truth is most of the time I do it manually. Or if I'm lucky, there's an admin at the client and I get them to do it. But it's a process of opening each workbook, going to several worksheets, copying data in a table, pasting it into a central repository, error filled or error prone. It's a nightmare. So what I did over the weekend, you know, I had spoken to a VB developer from Fiverr. I think the quote was like eight or $900 to do what I needed to do. And I was like, wow, I wonder if ChatGPT could do this for me. So let me show you. I filmed this because this is not my first rodeo and I know how um, the live demos go. So this is the prompt. I told it to create VB code for Excel. 
that would go to a directory, process each workbook, and copy all the tables into a separate workbook, a new workbook. So it generated the code, gave me instructions. We go into Excel, we open the VB editor, we copy this stuff in there and just run it. I didn't edit it, I didn't do anything. So it prompts me for a directory, gives me some weird message, and then it just does it. It took all those files that you saw in the directory and it stuck them all in one big table. Now I can do a bunch of pivot tables. I've, I've blurred it because this is actual customer data, but it actually, you know, made me, I don't even, I can't calculate it, 10,000% more effective with just a, you know, whatever. Generating the code took it two minutes, going to Excel, that took 30 seconds. For it to run, usually I have tens of these things, maybe 110 would be the biggest that I would do. So this thing would probably run for two or three minutes. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it actually provided me direct value, saved me a few bucks. Like the code I was gonna have the developer create for me would have been a lot more sophisticated and configurable, but for the price, zero and 10 minutes, I just can't beat this. So I think most people that see that are pretty impressed. That's pretty cool. Uh, some of the people I showed this to didn't realize that ChatGPT could do that kind of stuff. Uh, I used it very early on. I had like a bunch of notes from OneNote. I had a bunch of notes where uh, there were levels of bullets that were indented and I had it create a table. So I, I pasted that stuff in. I said, create a table where each level of bullets is in a different column. And it did it. It saved me like 10 minutes. And that was just like a random kind of experiment. So I think based on where we are today, there's something impressive about that. But if we think about this from a user experience perspective or a product perspective, it's not impressive at all, right? I have a problem in Excel. I completely change contacts and go to chat GPT, which may or may not be available. I have it generate a bunch of code, which, you know, at my level of seniority, let's put it that way. If I never see a line of code again, that's fine with me. Like, I don't need to see that. Uh, so it's really in terms of what an ideal experience would be hugely just like fractured. There's very rigid code and it tells you, hey, you can adapt this code. I have no interest in adapting that code. And just this level of sophistication makes it inaccessible to a lot of people. A lot of people would not be comfortable going into like the VB editor in Excel. I think about a lot of the leaders that I work with, like product leaders, CEOs. It's been years and years since they've you know, been down close to the metal like that. They have no interest in doing that, even though it's powerful. So what we have now is a very interesting time. We have super powerful technology. We have apps and UI paradigms that have been around forever. And a lot of the people that are on this call are gonna be the ones that figure out how these things merge, how these things come together, how we move from AI being this technology that happens in a lab somewhere to something that is directly accessible to us. You know, when I started my career, that's 20, 30 years ago, people built every application, they, they, they were building database applications. It was an application on top of a database. Now every application is built on top of a database. Nobody talks about it. And the same is happening to AI, although I think it will happen faster. So we are at a precipice or we've actually crossed a threshold where user expectations are going to change this year. Chat GPT was the killer app. It's going to change what people expect. It already has changed what I expect. And I would say this change is every bit as big as like when we went to GUIs. That was a big change that I'm old enough to have seen, you know, going from just DOS kind of screens to the first versions of Apple and then Windows. I think Windows really took it mainstream. And there will be winners and losers. 
at all these major watermark events, there will be winners and losers. And I worked for IBM. I worked for the Lotus brand. Uh, later, I guess I went to work there in like 93, I think. Uh, and, you know, before that, like let's say in the late 80s, Lotus 123 was the spreadsheet. And I'm going to guess there are people on this call that are young enough that have never even heard of it or don't know anything about it. It was about as dominant as an application could be. It almost single-handedly helped IBM enter the microcomputer market, the PC market. That's what uh, corporate customers were buying computers for to run 123. But then Microsoft came out with Windows and Lotus missed the boat. They didn't build a Windows version for a long time. And what's worse is when they did, they basically just recreated the DOS experience in Windows. And by then, Microsoft had generated several versions of Excel that were optimized for this new paradigm, working with a GUI. Back then, they could get away with murder. They were doing anti-competitive stuff that today would probably land people in prison. So, you know, it's not this simple. But it is very clear that Lotus didn't even give themselves a fighting chance because there was a fundamental change and they simply didn't react to it. They didn't see it. And what I'm telling you today is a lot of us have heard about AEI. A lot of us have looked into it. We've had the luxury of not really having to do much with it if it wasn't forced upon us. And that is about to change. And these are some events. They do not happen every day. But these all separated winners from losers. There was a time when you bought a computer and the software came with it, and that was it. We forget this. Back in the 50s, there were in 60s, there were legal cases in the states that forced vendors to separate those things. The GUI, the internet, search, and we'll talk search uh, more. But Chat GPT came out in November of last year. It's been out less than six months. And by my estimation, it will have at least as big an impact as these other things, but it will be really compressed because now people's expectations are changing. And it's the investments that we make now that will determine whether we're winning in a year or two years. So I have no doubt that people's expectation of technology is going to change. Microsoft has made a big bet on open AI. They claim they're going to integrate it with Office. I'm sure they will screw that up, but they will probably do some things. And going back to the example I gave you, you will be able to just say or type and say, hey, Excel, uh, take column A, separate the first name and last name, go to the internet, see if a phone number is available for them, go to LinkedIn, look up at their latest employer, and tell me if that company is a software vendor, and it's just going to do it. There's not gonna be all this typing, all this formulas, all this stuff. And that's a very straightforward example. You should think right now about the user experience for your product and think about what will change. Because today, nobody knows how these things are gonna be integrated. That story has not been captured. And as I said, you know, we are now sitting, uh, yeah, a once in a career, twice in a career, whatever opportunity. And what we're seeing is this, you know, inflection point. We're up to now, we've been talking about the technology, and that is where I started this presentation. What are the types of AI? What are the scenarios? Throughout the life cycle, what do PMs have to do to support that? I think there's a lot of material around there, and we'll talk about a little of it. But I think a much more important message is the world has changed in the last six months and product managers in product organizations need to lead the charge to take advantage and keep their organizations relevant. So this is the story. Are you gonna be Lotus 1, 2, 3? Are you gonna be Excel? Uh, by the way, does anybody, have you read about the technology behind GPT? This is my argument, who cares? Technicians care. Most of us in the software business don't really care what programming model is used to build the software. We don't really care. 
You know, that's not our biggest worry. And the same thing is happening with AI technology. It's going to get commoditized. And the people who are going to win are the people who understand it from a functional perspective and can deliver value. And that is what has happened with chat GPT. It was really frustrating. I read a bunch of articles, interviews with technicians who are like, well, this isn't anything new. We've been doing this forever. And I'm like, they just don't get it. That technology is interesting. Market value is compelling. And that's where we are now. We are at a level uh, that AI is actually delivering clear value uh, to people in a way that is novel, in a way that is new. And we should not underestimate the difficulty of this transition because this is a paradigm shift. And we use that term, we throw it around, a lot of people hate it, it's kind of overused. But to me, our a paradigm is just a set of assumptions that are so fundamental, we don't know they're there. We don't realize we are making this assumption. And every once in a while, something comes along and challenges those assumptions, invalidates those assumptions, and our paradigm has to change. Computers themselves did it, smartphones did it. When I was a kid, we didn't think you'd be able to walk around and talk to anybody in the world with a device that fit in your pocket. It was not part of our paradigm. We didn't get it. We just assumed those things were impossible or never thought to think they were possible. And what I'm telling you is that now as a product manager, you are going to have to blast through your paradigms about what a user experience is, about what a product can do. And it's super hard. And a great example of this is the way ChatGPT has made us rethink search. So six months ago, I was pretty happy with search. If you would have asked me what's the future of search, I would have said, I don't know. Maybe they're going to integrate like curation by AI or human curation. I don't know what it is. It had not really occurred to me that a lot of what we call search is really dialogue, getting an answer to a question. And that instead of showing me a bunch of resources and letting, letting me roll it myself, that there would be software that will just answer my question. That's the new paradigm. There will still be people who want to see a bunch of different lawnmowers and pick one. There will be other people that will say, hey, pick the best lawnmower for me. Here's my house. So six months ago, we didn't think like this. It's blown up that paradigm. It's going to blow up others. And if you are involved in developing products, you cannot ignore this or you should not ignore this if you expect your products to stay relevant. And there's always this false urgency when these things happen. We scramble a little bit. But, you know, a lot of this is software stuff. I would get after it because by the time you figure out what you need to do, patterns evolve that you're going to have to conform to. It'll be a couple of years before these things necessarily make it widespread, a few years, but you have to start now. And by the way, through this process, I realized that that's what innovation is. Innovation breaks paradigms. It's a very hard term to define. Ask yourself that. What is innovation? People have a tough time uh, explaining it. And now I know what it is. Sometimes it's simple, but real innovation challenges paradigms that we have, make us realize that, oh, wow, I didn't even realize I assumed that. I didn't realize I was assuming or that I needed to carry a device around with me, a computer that allows me to talk to people. Uh, a couple of years ago, I started developing a course on artificial intelligence for product managers. I got distracted, moved on but did some great uh, work with somebody named Marek Meyer. And this is the way we were thinking about it. This was our entry point back there, back then. We call these techniques, right? You can call them technologies or whatever. We've all seen these kind of taxonomies. You know, AI is an umbrella term for a bunch of different kinds of machine learning. There's this idea of representing knowledge and automated reasoning. Thanks to ChatGPT now, my mother knows about natural language processing. 
And there's a bunch of different sub areas there and technologies that support it, neural networks and all kinds of stuff. And then, you know, we looked at perception as a technique, and this may actually be moving more towards kind of like an archetype, but we can use artificial intelligence to do really sophisticated computer vision and speech. And, you know, there are all kinds of, there's all kinds of sensor data we can do stuff. This is a technical entry point, and it's kind of interesting, but these things are going to get commoditized. You're going to have to understand them as a product person the way you understand programming models. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Who knows how to do these things? And there will be new requirements. To make some of these things work, they will need a lot of data. And people will be looking to you as a product manager, if you're a product manager, to figure out that data. But I think we're moving past the point where we go deep into the techniques and can recite them. And what we identified are what I call now use case archetypes. So I give some examples, and I realize I didn't update the column headers in this table. My bad. Sorry about that. Uh, the first column is actually an archetype. There's a description and then some examples. Uh, so you may disagree, agree with this. This is what we came up with at the time, and I reread it, and I kind of liked it. You know, we can use AI to just gather information and make inferences from us that we do stuff with. We take that data and do stuff. There's another branch or other branches that are really dedicated to automating decision making. And that can be which lane to take in a driverless car, you know, an, an autonomous vehicle. It can be selecting which candidates we want to interview. Uh, there's a lot of like automated decision making going on in uh, insurance circles now. Is the car totaled? What should we pay for the amount of uh, damage on this house? There's a lot of task automation, and we saw that uh, with what I did in Excel. We separated another area, which is like robotics, because that's really meaningfully interacting with the physical world, which Excel does not do. It's really its own area, and yeah, there are subject matter experts there. And then we identified this a couple of years ago, conversational user interfaces. I didn't really change any wording or anything. I just took the work that we had done. And that's what we're seeing with ChatGPT. And it takes a while to understand ChatGPT, but pretty soon everybody will understand it. You know, ChatGPT is not like this transactional thing. You can actually have conversations with it. So after it does some work, you can say, oh, can you change this? Or can we add this or that or whatever it is? So as a product manager, we are functional. We're not technicians, although we should probably have an awareness of technician, te uh, you know, technical details, but this is what we need to start focusing on. What is the potential for these things? And how can I use this to be 10 times better than my competitors? How can I provide you know, my customers with information that help them do stuff? How can I help them not have to think too much about decisions? How can I make my application conversational? So it's not just somebody dumping data in and trying to figure out how this thing works, but my application actually has like a semi-structured conversation that goes in different directions. I can think of a million applications for that. I hope you can too. So what should you be doing as a product person? I would be looking at the existing technologies and use cases. I would be keeping my eye open because they will inspire you. I would be thinking about my product from a new perspective. I would be trying to break through my paradigms about the product. There are limits in your product that you just accept that you may have an opportunity now to blast right through. One thing I do to help me blast through a paradigm is from a UX perspective, you can do like this perfect experience experiment. And you say, if there were no technical limitations, what would the perfect experience look like? And that is a really fascinating conversation. Uh, it very often generates ideas that can impact your product. So I would be out there using technology as it's available. There are all these image generating uh, platforms now. There's chat GPT and a million other things. That's really just scratching the surface. So I would get out there and use it and start internalizing the value of these things. 
I would be keeping my eyes open for people that are doing interesting things. I have a good friend. He works for a company called Market Logic. They just this week launched a new product based on OpenAI. They licensed it. They do like market analysis and they have like chat GPT for market analysis. That's like the oversimplification I'll give you. And I would avoid the rush to develop a lot of this technology myself. Sometimes you have to, but a lot of times you won't have to. There's going to be technology out there. There will be APIs that will be commoditized and you can find ways to leverage it to at least do a proof of concept. So this change is happening. Changes have come before. When these changes happen, these paradigm shifts, they're winners, they're losers. Interested to think, I'm going to take a look at the comments in a minute. If you think I am overstating this case, I'm really not a techie. But as soon as I use chat GPT, I just had this feeling like this is something different. And now that I've played with it and taken a couple of steps back and looked at the overall picture, I realize this is big. This is something that will separate successful people from unsuccessful people. I threw a few resources in here. I think we can make these slides available. There are now marketplaces for chat GPT uh, prompts. People who know how to write a good prompt get better results than people who don't. And one of the signs of elegance or power is that now these things are getting recursive. So I can ask ChatGPT to write a prompt for ChatGPT. And the same things are gonna happen. We are going to ask artificial intelligence how we can use artificial intelligence better. So really exciting times. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. I hope this was valuable to you. Uh, we did not go deep into technology because we're moving beyond that. We are, it's a kind of new frontier that we're on. And the opportunities I think are massive. Uh, Stelios and I are working on various offerings on the intersection of AI and PM. We have some ideas about some programs that include coaching, training, some workshops, some really exciting stuff. If that interests you, you know, we're just getting it off the ground. We are going to identify a very limited number of people to take this journey with us. Uh, you will have an opportunity to help form it and, of course, to get the benefit from it. So for now, we didn't even build a landing page. Just reach out to us. This is really early days, but super exciting. Uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, and yeah. I would suggest that we just um, open the floor to questions or comments. I'm really curious what people think about uh, this, my excitement and all these things. What do you think? Feel free to jump in, ask a question. If, you, if you're more comfortable typing, that's great. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so. Um, with this, you know, AI innovation just at the front line of creation, um, it looks like you guys are mentioning doing some, you, you said you're mentioning creating some educational factors in AI. Um, is that like stri strictly kind of structuring some form of, I want to say, skills development as it's being as it's growing and the demand's growing, is that what you guys are, are currently working on? Yeah, well, I think what we're working on is being defined, but yes, yeah, skills development, I think would be part of it. Uh, I and would then, love to see, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, I would love to see part of this program give people actual practical value, so develop techniques so that these things can be applied. And part of that, again, is just like this creative process of how do we identify paradigms in our product and then how do we blast through those? And then, of course, follow up. How can we use AI and what are we learning and what are the patterns? I would like to drive kind of the tip of the spear uh, of, uh, yeah, this trend. I'm super excited about it. Okay, I have one more question. Well, actually, two. Um, on 
the chat GPT, which is AI integration, I think um, Google announced that chat GPT would like literally put them out of business, but then Google has been creating their own AI and I think Safari as well. Um, so everyone's kind of following the front line, which is chat GPT to integrate this. But I was just thinking like AI is obviously way faster because it's, you know, just capable of what we saw. Um, but without like the skill of knowing, like say your Excel spreadsheet, if you did not know how to do that, you, you just knew you wanted to make it more simple. You have to have some knowledge. So there's still like a lot of need for the people who are knowledgeable in that. This just makes all the coders have um, like extra fuel, like a turbo engine to be able to process all this way faster. So it's actually something really good for developers because the average person does not know what you just showed. Like they would not know that they have yeah, to do totally that. I totally agree. And you're right. Through all the roles that are involved in product development, it will lift all boats. But we have to be careful to not like accept the paradigm that we have today, which is if you want to do interesting things, if you want to manipulate data in Excel, you write some code or you write some formulas. Because there's probably a better way to do it, and it isn't defined yet. And I think you raise a really interesting use case. Let's say you didn't know how to use a spreadsheet, but you do know how to double click an icon. In 10 years, will that be enough? Will the application itself onboard you and teach you what it can do? Will the operating system, will you just be able to go to it and say, man, I need to gather data from my customers and analyze it? And will it be able to walk you through the steps? and actually build the technology for you in real time, I've got to guess, you know, it will. And I think that's a tiny sliver of what's going to be, uh, you know, of the innovation that's going to happen. Uh, so we have to be careful as these, thing these, these things happen to not just automate the current paradigm, but really so change the way uh, software works, for example. Yeah, so I was thinking um, as far as like, business development um excel integrating ai could create a platform such as like take for example people want to build websites but have no clue they create a platform where you just cut and paste like you know you don't have to do any coding at all so if excel integrated ai platforms so you just like you said will people punching you know double clicking something be usable in the future. Yeah, there'll always be that class that doesn't want to know all that stuff. So then there's business integration to provide those businesses that can make it easier for the average consumer. And, yeah. and so it yeah. just blows my mind what AI can do because we're at the beginning of everything. Um, but the, the last question I had, and this is very relevant, I'm doing the call for code um, with IBM, the global challenge for sustainability. And it just launched um, March 1st, but basically what you're supposed to do is integrate AI to how AI can help with sustainability in the different factors like emissions, um, just farming and all agriculture and all these different factors. But um, you spoke about education and I think AI can really be utilized in just the simple format of education for giving people the knowledge of of all of that data that people are unaware of so i was just thinking like just take it back to the basic of education right now there's so much in that factor so i just want to say thank you because you guys are kind of frontlining that and i'm glad that you put this together and i appreciate it yeah thanks so much for the questions and for the feedback uh, anybody out there willing to stand up and say i'm full of shit? that I'm way too excited about this stuff, that I'm, uh, does anybody feel like, like I'm pretty cynical when I hear somebody say that the world is changing and stuff, I'm like, yeah, heard that before. Anybody willing to, to play devil's advocate? No, but I'm old enough that I remember Lotus one, two, three <laughs> as well. Yeah. 
And I'm um, sorry, I'm sure if you could hear me. Um, but no, uh, and I also, uh, my first computer was a Commodore 64 and I hated having to remember the syntax to launch the Muppets game that I love to play. Yeah. <laughs> so when Windows 3.1.1 came along and I had to take like 49, three and a half discs just to, or three and a quarter discs just to load the OS. And then I, all I had to do was click on an icon. Yeah, I definitely remember that moment. And I would say blockchain was full of shit. <laughs> Crypto kitties are full of shit. Generative AI is not like this. I um, I both use this, so I have my own app where we leverage the GP3 API for a couple of different things ourselves, and we're actually going to kind of when you talk about shrink the stack, where we'll enable a product team that used to be 40 today to be three tomorrow, just because of how powerful this stuff is. Wow! But then, no, no, <laughs> um, but then, um, yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, education, all these other areas where you know, instead of having to hire a copywriter like me, like, or like even a lawyer to write basic legal language, I just asked ChatGPT. I said, Hey, I have a web app that does this, this, and this, write the terms of service. And I just had to add like our state and it was really, really good. So like, it's even going to start saving businesses, you know, trillions of dollars. Cause you don't have to wait and hire, you know, somebody to do that for you. You can just ask somebody and it's done in 30 seconds. So, you know, I don't think you're full of shit. This is definitely something that's going to completely change it's just how do we yeah. yeah just the only thing i think i worry about on the other side of that i'm very conscious as well as a product designer and as a graphic product designer uh how do we make sure we don't lose our humanity in all of this or how do we like people <laughs> of certain ages have a tendency to overbelieve what's on the internet if it's coming from a generative ai that's either text or audio you're seeing in the washington post people are using uh, 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 whisper to create audio of people sounding like they're being kidnapped to elicit money out of people. <laughs> so there's definitely going to be a second wave of like, okay, this is great, but A, how do we handle it in a way that's responsible? Uh, yeah. And how do we remember our humanity through all of this as well? So that's going to be, I think, the, the existential question that a lot of companies and people are going to face. Yeah, I think you're right. And an area I really want to get into and develop some expertise in is ethics around this stuff, because there will be backlash. It's going to be a big deal. It's just so powerful. And you raised like 1% of the things that could have, you know, yeah, I, I saw the same thing. I saw a guy whose parents lost $50,000 because somebody used AI to mimic his voice and call them and tell them, you know, he was in trouble. So yeah, it's a spooky world. Anybody else a little more cynical about this than some of the rest of us? So, Greg, I think I think uh, you know, like any tools, if there's an application for it, there will be some of this moving into product management. You know, uh, certainly you're seeing some of this AI moving into application testing and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the ways that we're going to see some tampering or sort of tamper down and, and, and putting a nice cold water is we haven't talked about is security, right? So when you think about, you know, everything that you're asking is going to some work and that is accessible at some point by somebody, not saying that it's necessarily, hey, if I ask somebody how to create a PowerPoint, that's not exactly the most secure, you know, it's not, yeah. nobody's really interested in that. But let's just say something does go out, right? So, you know, that is something uh, I think you mentioned earlier under regulations. You're absolutely right. That's probably just coming around. Uh, and of course, he'll be, you know, really behind uh, technology. But I think that's something that at some point, all of us are going to have to have a serious uh, conversation about, which is the security side around this. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Sushal. And it reminds me of the conversations we were having 10 or 15 years ago about the cloud. You know, so yeah, there's going to be ample opportunity for people to innovate and you're right. You know, a lot of practical considerations. It's not going to be the honeymoon will be over soon. Somebody will have to solve some of the hard problems, but I think the people who do are going to win. Yeah. Any I, questions or comments? Yeah, Greg, hi, this is Tapan here. Hey, so I, I think as far as a lot of information is available on the public web, then tools like ChatGPT can read, understand, mine that information and present data, right? So if you're planning a trip to Barcelona, you could use a ChatGPT app and it will give you a great itinerary, taking into account various factors like opening times, working days, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, but 
I, I don't think chat GPT is going to take away all the work from developers, right? Let's say there's a severity yeah. one issue in a payment application. Somebody needs to debug it. You still, I don't think chat GPT can then look into my code and figure out where the bug is, right? So uh, while there are a lot of applications of chat GPT using open data, uh, but I think in areas where, there are areas where it would need to be trained, right? Specifically. Yeah, it's about pr productivity, probably, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. And it, well, it will, but as uh, Matthew, if if you look at chat right now, if you make enough people efficient, it's disruptive to the job market. You don't need as many people. So, you know, we were already on this, like in my career, I've seen this no code thing come and low code come and go a million times. I think now it's here to stay. And now if you look at stuff like this, you know, that is a scenario for a product manager. You will be able to do not just kind of refrigerator art MVP. You'll be able to build a decent application that's probably reasonably secure without having to at first bother engineering. You know what I mean? The, the possibilities I think are going to be really exciting. Yeah. Hi, it's Anthony here. Um, brilliant presentation. Um, I just have one question as. Well, I've got three points, really. One area that you've not touched on, which I think, um, and it's, I think it's just because the information is not out there, is that the data that is being used to inform people with chat GTP is about four years old. I don't know if you're aware. Yeah, I, what, I, I what that mean. that old, but I know it's not connected to the internet. They have some kind of cache of like, right? Everything, yeah. Um, and all, it's all to do with um, responsible AI. So I think people need to be really careful when they're using that information that they are cognizant it's it's not as new, especially if you're a developer and you're using to debug code, thinking about how much development also changes the different type of frameworks that you're using. If you're going to be using that, it's good for a starting point, but not for you to move forward. Yeah. Um, the other area which I think, and I felt, I, I um, attended the product call and I was speaking to Carlos and he said one area that the product managers need to start really thinking about is moving away from um, just looking at user requirements which are coming from uh, the client and start looking at the data the clients have and try to innovate and generate new code because everything is becoming data centric no matter where you look there's billions of data and there's a lot of opportunities yeah. there and he was saying he's looking with his team with product school to um, understand um, how to train people to look at data, get some insights on the data, not from a marketing perspective, but from generating new application, new solutions. So I think that might be also another good area which you could investigate in your journey. Um, and then the final bit is um, copywriting and the data. Uh, one of the things from my company, they've um, um, come back to us uh, so and they've told us under no circumstances should you use chat GTP data Plant uh, material because, as you said, there will be legal ramifications as we move to the future because some of the data that is being used by Chat GTP is confident is it might be publicly available, but do they have the consent to distribute it without saying this person created this data? If you know what I mean. But brilliant presentation, thank you. Thanks so much. And all these issues you guys are bringing up, absolutely. The, the honeymoon will be over very soon and some people are gonna have to solve the hard problems. And I guess that at the meta level is another thing PMs uh, will play a role in is solving those hard problems. So I think we're really close to the top of the hour. Stelios, I don't know, did you want to say something else? No, I think it was a great presentation, a very interesting discussion. Like there's some um, notes as we're closing. As Greg mentioned, we are planning to run a program for product managers interested in AI uh, or data scientists interested in the product management. Uh, make sure to get in touch. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have a, um, a tradition of sharing my books with uh, anyone who is attending these events and you know, is kind enough to send us an email. Um, also, make sure to check out our website. We organize events uh, very regularly. Most of them are free. 
Um, and yeah, we'll be very happy to, to hear from you guys. And also this will be uploaded on our YouTube channel and our website. Just check uh, our blog and make sure to follow if you haven't already. Uh, so thanks everyone. And that's it from me. I don't know, Greg, whether you'd like to say any uh, few words before we, we head off. Now, one word, now. Thanks everybody. Really great questions and engagement. Really appreciate it. Please connect. Uh, on LinkedIn. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you on the other side. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.